Welcome to the last lecture of this course. I hope the many exercises were useful. Some of them were a bit straightforward. Others looked easy but turned out to be difficult. The important thing is that you now have an insight, a personal insight about what the TPM can do and what the TPM cannot do. This is important because of the rising requirements for security and the actual needs of protecting our data better. And this is just the start. This is the essentials course. So it's natural to have a learning curve. The important thing is that you took the first step and good job on completing this course. Why did we do this today? Why did we have this course now? Why not tomorrow? There's plenty of time, right? Well, to answer this question, I need to take you just a month back and tell you a little story. Last month, I was invited to lead a discussion panel about the future of IoT security. And as the moderator, I was expected to provide the topics. One of the topics was post-quantum cryptography. I'm very interested in this topic, but to be honest, I have a fundamental knowledge and understanding of what's happening right now in this space, but I would not call myself an expert. The question, the only question I asked about the topic and the conversation just took off was where we are in the hype cycle. And this is the hype cycle as defined by Gartner, famous consultants. And while there are other variations of this diagram, this one seems to be the most popular and it's a fairly good approximation of a lot of trends that happen in technology recently. So why did we do this course today? Why not tomorrow? Let's try to answer that question. My journey started in 2014 when I was tasked to develop a remote attestation solution for a router manufacturer, a professional equipment for routing the telecommunications of a whole city. These were rooms filled with racks. Each rack was an x86 server with massive Xeon CPU and so on and so on. And it had a TPM 1.2. This was 2014, TPM 2.0 was not mass available. In fact, it was very difficult to purchase at the time because the production was just scaling. So this is how my journey started. And it took me a while to figure out how things happen in the industry. For me, the biggest shock was that this very useful technology at the time was used so little and yet in so many places. It's a paradox. On the one side, it was already in almost every x86 personal computer. On the other hand, it was very difficult to use it. There was the trousers, uh, TPM 1.2 software stack. It had a lot of problems. I myself had to fix a bug to use it for a mode attestation that I remember. And just going through this experience, I can definitely tell you there was a lot of excitement in the year afterwards and maybe the up to around 2017 when the TPM 2.0 was now mass available, it started replacing TPM 1.2 in personal computers, in servers. There was big talks about entering, um, I don't remember, but uh, there, there was a deal with a, a cinematic company even announced at one point that was going to use TPM in some way. Uh, and this sparked a lot of controversy, right? Oh, protecting content and whatnot. Yeah, but at the same time, I've experienced the usefulness of this chip in protecting the counter of the network adapter of this professional router and actually just a number of professional routers that were working together and how this solved an actual business problem. On the other hand, then we used it to further improve the security of the router itself. So I was very excited and you can probably sense it in my voice about this technology. So it was to my shock to understand that in 2015, there was only SAPI available, the system API as defined by the TCG. It was, I think, about two years later at Embedded World when I learned that finally eSAPI was implemented. I remember it was, uh, the work was sponsored by Infineon, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a big news. It was a big moment for the whole industry that now we have this 
more rich API to use and implement applications. At the same time, I remember that uh, this transition kind of broke what I've built so far because I've relied so much on SAPI and uh, the tools kind of transitioned to eSAPI. So why am you telling you this story? Well, this was 2015, 2017. This is when things were really, really excited and there were a lot of expectations about what would come next. Of course, there is a knowledge barrier, there is a know-how barrier, there is a learning curve and all of this played part. But things changed. Today, it's 2023 and we have so much more. Before talking about today's state, I want to talk a bit more about what actually took place in these years to help you understand why it is important to take this course today and why it is great for you that you completed this course and gained this knowledge. The story of the TCG starts in 1999. Back then it was called with a different name. I think Compaq was also part of the consortium that started the TPM specification. It was only two years later when the first TPM version, actual hardware chip was manufactured by IBM. And at the time, IBM, I think was the sole manufacturer of this chip. So it's no surprise that in 2002, the first commercial product of the shelf that anyone could buy was ThinkPad T30 that featured the TPM 1.0. And remember, this is at the very beginning. This is what Gartner called a technology trigger. For me, it's important that this was the moment when people start to experience, okay, what is this technology about? What can we do with it? It took a long time before the technology itself became standardized. And this is a difficult task. It takes a lot of time to go through the motions of creating a standard and also have it in the proper form as text and, and comply with the rules there are to actually put a standard forward that is a worldwide recognized ISO EIC standard. Uh, it contains four parts which match the TCG specification. Uh, we have structures, commands, architecture, and so on. So if you read the standard, it's very similar to the specification and it gets occasional updates because as the TCG continues to work on improving the TPM, the standard needs to uh, adopt these changes as well. So what was the pivotal moment? Again, I think it was around 2014, 15, when everyone was already trying to use TPM 1.2 and we were seeing the value, but at the same time, it was difficult, some things were not working, there were issues. So when TPM 2.0 became available, naturally, companies and professionals became very excited. Afterwards, we got the SAPI implemented. In 2019 came the FAPI. Something else happened at that time as well. The TPM cost came down and many new TPM stacks came to life. This is very important for the adoption of one technology to become accessible and affordable. On one hand, we have many TPM vendors. On the other hand, we have many new TPM stacks. And at the same time, we now can afford purchasing a TPM chip for $1 per unit when we order a certain quantity. And this is the major difference between 2015 and 2019. This is a major shift for the industry. In 2015, we had to order 100,000 pieces to get the $1 per unit price. In 2019, this changed. We could order only 10,000 pieces and we would still get the $1 per unit price. This happened for various reasons. The market was more mature. There was more capacity at the manufacturing plants and the TPM was more widely adopted. Now, there was a bit of a going back around 2021 because of the chip shortage that hit everyone worldwide. But I feel nowadays in 2023, things are back to normal and why this is important. So starting from startups who manufacture maybe in the realm of thousands at the beginning, going through small and medium businesses who manufacture devices in maybe the 10,000s to 100,000 devices, having this change allows more companies, more products to integrate the TPM. And this is what we're seeing today. More embedded systems are integrating the TPM aerospace, medical, you name it. So this is a big change. The accessibility of the device itself is important. 
But what also important is what software we can use, what tools are available to actually integrate that chip into our system or use that chip if it's already part of the system, especially when we talk about servers and laptops. And there are many, many good things that happen to the TPM software stacks throughout the years, especially after the first introduction of SAPI in 2015. By 2018, we had five different TPM software libraries that we can choose from. We added the Microsoft stack with a major version 2 for its .NET version and almost every possible TPM functionality supported. This is a major milestone for Microsoft and the industry. Then by 2018, we also had the Wolf TPM stack emerging and the Google TPM stack emerging. Go TPM today is a project with many contributors as well. So it's no longer the Google stack, it is the Golang stack. At the same time, I see a lot of effort going into the new stacks as well as the old and very mature solutions. For example, at the beginning, GoTPM didn't have one-to-one -one mapping with TPM commands. Wolf TPM had it from the beginning and later added wrappers while GoTPM was going toward a mild layer on top from the very beginning. So we saw two very different design patterns at the beginning and later they kind of met. Now both stacks have one-to-one -one mapping and wrappers for rich operations, rich API, similar to the FAPI and ESAPI that we mentioned often in this course. So this is important. All of these stacks today are quite mature. They support almost every possible TPM operation there is. There's still some corner cases maybe here and there, but they're open source libraries. You can raise an issue on GitHub and you get responses, you get help, which is important. Also now we have TPM communities. We have also the OST2 TPM course, which has discussion boxes where we can also discuss problems and challenges. So I feel very optimistic for what's coming next. And in my opinion, this is the plateau of productivity. If we look back at the hype cycle, meaning that we are out of the hype cycle and entering the mass adoption of the TPM by small, medium and large organizations in the next maybe 10 years or so. So you being here at the beginning of this is important. You have a competitive advantage at the job market and you can help your company, your product be more secure. What can you do more? Well, we first ask ourselves, what can we do more for you? And this is, we're working on an advanced TPM course. In the meantime, I have some ideas for you. First, please look at your daily workflow. Look at the product or the project that you're currently working. Isn't there a way to integrate the TPM to help your security to be more sure of how the device operates or protect the sensitive data, the sensitive parameters and configuration files? I believe even if you look at your personal computer, you can use the TPM to protect your personal folder or folder with notes or with drawings. And I think this is a great experiment. Experiment more. Create your own TPM application in your free time and see how useful that is. Make a prototype for the project that you're currently on. Propose it in a product meeting and see the responses. Have a brainstorming session. This is sort of a challenge after the course is over. Then, if you're looking for more interesting technology coming out of the Trusted Computing Group and in general, what's coming next in the Trusted Computing domain, there is a framework originally started by Microsoft called DICE. I call it a framework for computer trust because it can work with different hardware security modules and even without in some cases where you have an SOC, a very embedded device, and it has NVRAM that can be burned once, written once, and then you can have a secure boot process, you can answer the root of trust, and from there you can make some guarantees. So DICE provides some flexibility, is an interesting thing, and maybe it is not at the same stage as the TPM as maturity, maybe it's not there yet, at the plateau of productivity, 
but I think it's definitely a trusted computing technology that we all should look at and help develop further. Now comes time to my personal favorite, a very new trusted computing technology called Mars. In my opinion, Mars is a lightweight TPM. It is something that the industry has been asking for a long, long time. Mars uses less algorithms, less space, less memory in general. It is designed to be integrated in silicon solutions, so in chips. But in theory, it can be put on FPGA, and this is how it's being currently tested, and you can add it to your product even today. Now, how production ready that is, I couldn't tell. For me, it would be maybe a bit too early. This would be for early adopters, for companies and people, professionals who really need such lightweight solution. But with time, I believe that Mars will be a valuable contribution to the trusted computing available tools. And feel free to just check out the TCG side, the TPM communities, and learn more about the available solutions and new projects. I can assure you there are many, including there is now a TPM on a USB stick. If you're a Mac user, there is a way for you to, to use the TPM, an actual physical hardware TPM, and protect your, let's say, personal folder or create your own TPM application. As mentioned at the beginning of this slide, experiment more. I want to thank everyone that took the course, and this course would not have been possible without the belief of Zeno Kovac, the founder of uh, Open Security Training 2, that the trusted computing field is important and it needs more resources for learning. It needs more practical resources for people who want to gain more skills into the field of computer security. We worked for a long time with Zeno to bring this course to life. And at times it was uncertain, but we kept at it. So I want to thank him for staying the course and showing persistence in this effort. Now, I want also to thank our video editor who has done a great job following our requests of how to do the videos, what to change, how to help us make them better. And we hope that you like the quality that we provide you we really tried to go for the highest quality possible at the time and you would notice that our videos are in 4k format this is just one example of the work then i really want to thank the people who took this course because the beta testers would help shape what we've built and this is important because we are also human we make mistakes we miss things and it's a learning curve for us, what's really needed for the students, where we need to put more effort to explain better, to explain more, maybe provide more examples and so on and so on. Then for the professionals and students who are seeing this technology for the first time, we hope that you found a valuable resource. We hope that this serves you as a guide and as a tool for the future. So you can always come back and look at the course and remember something, repeat something, and find a solution for a problem. Last but not least, I want to thank the Trusted Computing Group and all of its members for the work that they're doing, because without the specifications that make the TPM a standard tool, standard way of communicating with the TPM, standard set of TPM commands and properties, yes, standardization is not perfect, but it helps us have this tool that we can put in embedded systems, in servers, in laptops, even in phones, if you, if you think about it. At one point, there was even an automotive TPM. There is still a spec about it, I think. My point is that the TCG does the hard work, and it's not always a public work. It becomes public after time when the drafts have been made and a lot of work has already gone into the documents and into the process. This initial work on standardization of the TPM separates it as a solution when we compare it with other hardware security modules and secure elements. So thank you. Send us your questions at our course email or write us in the discussion box after each unit. Till we meet again.